So now we get a chance to explore perhaps in more detail some of the specific ECG findings that we're, we're talking about um, from the international criteria and give you just a, an overview of normal ECG findings. We're going to have several talks um, and, and workshops to go in this in more detail. Um, I, I really believe that in the sports medicine community that sports physicians need to understand how to look at an ECG. You, you may decide not to use it in screening, but, but you should have that as a tool in your toolbox for the cardiovascular evaluation uh, of your athletes. Um, and certainly in the, in the cardiology world, uh, we also need to be able to distinguish normal findings in athletes from, from abnormal findings in athletes. So, so regardless of your position on screening, I, I think as a clinician responsible for the cardiovascular care in athletes, um, accurate interpretation is certainly one of the goals. Um, between this talk and what comes up later, there's going to be some repetition. The repetition is on purpose. The repetition is to help us um, uh, learn, um, to look at some of the um, figures and, and whatnot that we'll see time and time again or different representations um, so we can see some of those infrequent patterns uh, of what we consider either normal or, or abnormal findings. So uh, for this talk, we'll, we'll focus a lot on the normal findings. And again, uh, this is from the international criteria. If you don't have this article, it is freely available um, from the BGSM uh, website. Website. And again, uh, the purpose of the international criteria, obviously, to update the, the standards, develop that guide uh, uh, for the appropriate evaluation of ECG abnormalities, and hopefully produce an evidence-based clinical expert consensus uh, document. So let's look at um, figure one in, in, that, uh, in those documents, the international criteria for ECG interpretation in athletes, um, where much like the revised criteria, we created um, green, yellow, and, and red lists green being the normal findings, red being the clearly abnormal findings, and yellow being uh, these sort of borderline ECG findings. I, I think it's important to recognize um, that these are interpreted almost with the assumption that this is an asymptomatic athlete and that there's no family history of inherited cardiac disease or sudden cardiac death. So if you do have a normal ECG finding, then, then no further evaluation uh, is required. In contrast, if you have an abnormal finding in the red box or you have two or more of our borderline findings, um, that requires additional investigation. Um, so, so in this talk, we're going to dive into some of these sort of green light or, or normal uh, ECG findings. Who should we apply this uh, to? And this is one of the questions uh, in the last panel discussion. And the criteria are uh, applied uh, for athletes age 12 to 35, and, and how do we define an athlete? Well, an athlete's involved in regular exercise or training um, for, for sports or general fitness. There's typically a premium on performance, often team or individual competition, and as Sanjay alluded to, training-related physiological changes are more common in athletes um, with intensive exercise more than four hours a week. Which makes us, um, we should recognize and perhaps press pause that at lower levels of regular exercise or in the presence of cardiovascular symptoms or a family history of inherited cardiovascular disease or premature sudden cardiac death, the interpretation standards may require some uh, modification. Sanjay did a great job at, at sort of organizing um, physiologic cardiac adaptation to athlete's heart. As we know, there's some increased uh, vagal tone and large chamber size from wall thickness and cavity uh, uh, dimension increases. From the vagal tone side, uh, findings like sinus bradycardia, arrhythmia, early repolarization, uh, through Mobitz type 1 second degree AV block, uh, considered normal findings. And then, of course, the increased chamber size leading to um, left ventricular uh, hypertrophy uh, voltage criteria and incomplete right bundle branch block. And as Sanjay also said, um, that other things influence these physiologic cardiac adaptations. So question, how often do trained athletes fulfill voltage criteria for LVH using Sokol offline uh, standards? Um, and, and as we get into this, one of the studies that stood out for me was from Nathan Riding uh, um, from the Aspatar group uh, with several other colleagues. And they uh, assessed the, the 2010 ESC uh, guidelines in high-level male athletes exercising more than six hours per week. 600 Arabic athletes, 415 black or African athletes, 160 Caucasian athletes, and they had 200 uh, controls as well. And if we look closely at their, at their findings, obviously sinus bradycardia was quite prevalent. Uh, incomplete right bundle branch block uh, in, in 30 to 60 percent uh, of those athletes. Left ventricular uh, hypertrophy voltage criteria in over 50 percent of athletes across the board. For uh, SD elevation or early repolarization findings, over 80% of those athletes had these findings. 
In other words, we can't pick a criteria that occurs in more than half of the athletes and use that as a distinguisher between uh, pathology um, and, and normalcy. Um, so we have, to, we have to get a little bit more uh, specific than that. When I look at an ECG, what I'm, I, I simplify it a little bit you know, to try to say, is this normal or abnormal? Um, normal means I'm reassured, no further evaluation is needed. Admirable meaning that further evaluation is required to um, rule in or rule out uh, the presence of uh, cardiac uh, pathology. If it is abnormal, I think we want to specifically know what is the ECG abnormality um, and therefore um, have an understanding of what the appropriate next steps are in that evaluation. Um, in uh, the uh, international uh, criteria uh, documents, is, is table one, which is really important. Again, this gets back to the definition so you understand exactly what you're looking for. And we're gonna walk through uh, some of these with some uh, figure representations. Um, Joe Merrick will talk uh, in much greater detail on isolated increases in, in QRS voltage. Uh, this is a normal appearing uh, ECG, but you can see the striking QRS amplitude um, that is present here. Um, uh, well over uh, 35 millimeter uh, cutoff uh, for Sokoloff line uh, criteria, but this is a, a normal looking uh, ECG. Incomplete right bundle branch block, um, which shows the sort of rabbit ear appearance in, in V1 with a uh, RSR prime, um, but a QRS complex that's less than 120 milliseconds. Again, a fairly common uh, finding in our uh, athlete group. Um, in the absence of other clinical markers of concern would not require more evaluation. Here's a nice example of earlier polarization. This is a 29-year-old asymptomatic soccer player. Um, it has several findings that we should look at. Um, obviously, you can see the, the J point and ST elevation uh, predominantly in the lateral and uh, inferior leads. You can see peaked uh, uh, T waves and, and also um, the, the striking voltage um, that is represented here for, for LVH. This is a normal appearing uh, ECG in a young athlete. Sanjay alluded to, and we'll talk uh, in greater detail about um, a repolarization variant that is present in uh, black athletes or athletes of uh, African Caribbean uh, um, descent. And I'll draw your attention to the uh, SC segment elevation and T wave inversion that is confined to leads uh, V1 through V4. Um, for this pattern, there is J point elevation, um, a convex or domed uh, shaped uh, SC segment followed by uh, T wave inversion, and that T wave inversion is always confined to leads uh, V1, 2, 3, or 4, but does not extend beyond uh, lead 4. This is just another example, again, uh, of the black athlete repolarization variant uh, in leads V1 uh, through V4, and we're gonna see more uh, of that. This is a normal finding uh, in a um, black athlete, does not require further investigation. Uh, Jack Salerno, I think, is gonna uh, talk about uh, juvenile T wave inversion. In our practice, this is really important to include um, in the new criteria set, because we had many athletes that we were screening that were under the age of 16, um, but had some T wave inversion that extended through um, V3. Uh, and, and really, uh, the, the persistence of a juvenile T wave inversion pattern in, in V1, V2, or V3 um, in an athlete of any race under the age of 16 should be considered a normal finding in the absence of other uh, clinical markers of concern. This is an example of a, a junctional escape rhythm um, in a 28-year-old Caucasian male. And one of the things that will uh, trigger your understanding of a, a junctional escape rhythm is you uh, bring your eyes down to the uh, lead to uh, sort of rhythm strip when you're looking for those P waves and asking where they are, where you see a couple of them very early and perhaps P waves hidden in the QRS complex later on. Is a, is a very um, consistent uh, RR interval between the beats um, that represents the junctional escape rhythm. As this person uh, begins to exercise, uh, they will go back into sinus rhythm and this will resolve. This is a common and, fair and normal finding in a young athlete. First degree uh, atrial uh, ventricular block or AV block uh, is, is also a normal finding in our athletes, uh, represented uh, by a P interval, PR interval greater than 200 milliseconds. The PR interval is measured from the beginning of the P wave 
to the beginning of the QRS complex, as you can see um, on, on this ECG trading, uh, tracing. In this particular figure, it's about 300 milliseconds. Um, in our uh, criteria set, uh, a PR interval uh, up to 400 milliseconds would be considered a normal finding in the absence uh, of symptoms. This ECG shows a Mobitz type 1 or Wenke-Bach second degree uh, AV block. Um, and let's spend a, a moment to sort of walk through this. In Mobitz type 1, Wenke-Bach uh, uh, second degree AV block, um, there is progressively longer PR intervals until there is a non-conducted uh, P wave and no QRS complex. So you can see here um, that the initial PR uh, here is 140 milliseconds, then a little bit longer, 190 milliseconds, then a little bit longer, 200 milliseconds, and then there's a P wave and sort of a drop beat or no QRS complex. And then importantly, um, the PR interval uh, in the next QRS complex, um, that PR interval is shorter than the last PR interval uh, before the dropped um, QRS beat. And again, this makes it consistent with Mobus type 1, second degree AV block. If you exercise this individual, they go back into sinus rhythm um, and becomes more standard. Um, this is a normal finding on a resting ECG or, and does not require more investigation. I want to um, change a little bit to sort of our yellow flag or, or, or list of borderline findings um, from this criteria set, specifically axis uh, deviation and atrial enlargement and complete right bundle branch block. These are uh, ECG findings where there is some uncertain, uncertainty whether or not this represents perhaps uh, pathology uh, in a young athlete population or just be considered uh, normal. And, and in the Seattle criteria, complete right bundle branch block was actually a, a normal finding and sort of moved over to the right to a borderline group. In the revised criteria, right bundle branch block was listed as, a, as an abnormal or red finding and then moved over uh, to the left to the, to the borderline group. Um, but two or more of these borderline findings um, are, are uncommon and, and should, rep, uh, should trigger some uh, additional investigation. We didn't just decide on what goes in that yellow group uh, somewhat arbitrarily. It was uh, thankfully driven by uh, good research and science, uh, some of which needs to be reproduced. But this was a wonderful study uh, by Sanjay and his group that looked at axis deviation and atrial enlargement um, in young athletes and whether or not these represented good markers uh, of pathology. So in this study, there were uh, over 2,500 athletes and no athlete with isolated left or right axis deviation or left to right atrial enlargement showed evidence of cardiomyopathy as a single finding. In contrast, in 171 patients with, with HCM, um, there were coexisting ECG abnormalities present in almost 90% who did have uh, axis deviation or atrial enlargement. So it was studies like this that allowed us to uh, break down the criteria uh, a little bit further and, and put um, things like axis deviation and atrial enlargement uh, as, a, as a warning flag but in isolation would be considered normal, but if there's two or more of those findings or any other ECG abnormality, uh, trigger the ECG for more investigation. So what does is, what is some of these look like on an ECG? Uh, this is an example of, of left atrial enlargement. Um, if we look at the P wave in, in lead two, um, greater than 120 milliseconds or th uh, three uh, small boxes, um, and then also in V1, that there's a negative portion of the P wave that's greater than one millimeter in depth and more than 40 milliseconds in duration or one box. One of the reasons I put this ECG up here is because many people still um, look at left atrial enlargement and sort of overcall it in the young athlete group, um, looking only at V1 when there's a negative portion um, of the uh, P wave. And really our criteria is that you need both. You need both the, the wide, P wave in, in lead one or two, and you need that negative portion in V1 to qualify as left atrial enlargement. Um, an example here of uh, left axis deviation, um, I probably don't need to uh, remind you how to, look, how to look for this, but this is a represent, uh, representative of left axis deviation. Uh, the QRS is positive in lead one, but negative in lead AVF and lead two, um, suggesting that the, the axis is is sort of leftward of uh, minus 30 um, and, and would uh, qualify for left axis deviation in this ECG about minus 70. An example of complete right bundle branch block, um, again, that R, S, R prime appearance often in V1 
but a QRS uh, duration that's greater than 120 milliseconds. And one of the other um, uh, key findings here uh, to suggest that it is complete right bundle branch block is an S wave in, in V6 uh, that is wider than the R wave uh, also in V6. This is an ECG of right bundle branch block um, in isolation with no other clinical markers of concern in a trained athlete would be left alone without more investigation. Um, in combination with other borderline or, uh, or red box uh, ECG abnormalities would require more investigation. So in summary, um, normal ECG findings in athletes are physiologic adaptations to regular exercise. I think when we interpret the ECG, we have to understand the definitions and really the precise definitions of what we're looking for. Um, and uh, these findings do not require additional investigation in the absence of other ECG abnormalities or clinical markers of concern. We'll have a chance to, to go into this in, in more detail in, in coming talks as well as the workshops. Uh, thanks very much for your attention.